Okay, um, not too many versions ago. There were some really nifty tools that were added to Photoshop that help you to um, retouch photographs. Um, and they are located here. Um, obviously in the tool panel. Hold on for a second. Right under here, right under this exacto knife. There is a spot healing brush tool, a healing brush tool, a patch tool, and to remove red eye, you can use that. Um, also, in addition to that, we have a couple of others that we'll be using too in the rest of this exercise. And the one that we'll be using is this one here. It looks like a rubber stamp. This is the clone stamp tool. It's actually an older one. The healing tool, the spot healing tool, and the patch tool were new. I mean, relatively new. When I say relatively, I think it was version six or seven that they were added. That's not too many versions ago, but they're really pretty new. And um, the first day that I did the overview of this program, I showed you this guy, and I showed you how to illuminate his wrinkles. And I was blown away when I first saw these tools because I thought they were going to be a joke, but they really move really very nicely and very smooth for the most part. <clears throat> um, the key to retouching photographs is to make something look believable and quote natural. You know, that's in finger quotes. Um, I can remove all of his wrinkles, but that's going to look pretty strange. Um, he's going to look, you know, babies don't have wrinkles, but people in the middle age typically do. You know, sun and that sort of thing. So you do want some wrinkles, but you want to minimize them. So it looks believable, but they look healthy. They look as good as possible. So the recommendation the book gives us, and it is a good one, that what we want to do is we want two layers. You need your layers panel visible. And if it's not, it will be found under here, under window, under layers, and when it's checked, it should be visible either to the side or we click and drag it off as, as I've done and put it here next to our follow here. Now by default, he is a background layer, so I can't put anything beneath it. I can't have any other layers beneath it, only layers on top. What I want to do is make a duplicate of this layer. So what I'm going to do is click and drag right here. So I have my original layer and I have background copy. The retouching that I'm going to do is going to be on the top copy version. And then what I'm going to do by altering the opacity of this top layer, I'm going to blend these two. I'm going to start by removing all of his wrinkles and make him look kind of bizarre. And then by altering the opacity of that layer, I'm going to allow the layer beneath it, which is his old version with wrinkles, for some of that to show through. By copying the layer in the manner that I did, these are perfectly registered on top of one another. Okay? They register perfectly. So the blending between those two layers will work very nicely. Um, the book suggests a variety of things. I'm going to use mostly the healing tool here. And when I zoom in, it's changed a bit from its earlier you used to have to make a selection by holding down the option key and clicking. I guess you still do. And now we click and we drag across and block so the wrinkle is gone. Move down here. I'm going to option click again because I'm selecting. What it's doing is it's taking the texture, the underlying texture from this, and giving me the smoothness in here. It's keeping the color intact. So now I'm going to drag across and it's gradually, if I'm not careful, it brought some of his hair in there too. Notice where the little crosshairs are going above. So you might want to do it in little spurts. All gone. Blends perfectly. You can zoom in on that as much as you want and it just looks incredible. Go ahead. What do you go across the bottom of this? Huh? When you do the crosshair is where it's taking the sample from. Oh, okay. So if you move it across, it's actually taking the sample from it. Oh, okay. Can you like by any chance like fix that? I can always change it. You hold down the option key and say, I want to take a sample from here instead. Now watch, it starts there and moves across. 
so I'm removing all these little wrinkles. You know, I mean, I can take from here. I still want nice smooth skin up here. Where your forehead, typically you have a smooth as it's stretched the tightest. You don't get wrinkles on this part. Only where you furrow your brow. So. so we can remove the wrinkles from here. Good. Gone. It is perfect. It's, it's amazing how well this works. Take some wrinkles from here, remove them. From here, remove them. And it, this is going to start to look pretty weird. And because partly the texture is going to be different too. And it just looks very strange. But I've removed the bulk of his, his wrinkles. And I've also screwed up the, the glasses too. So that's not good. So let me go back um, to history. And let's bring some of these back. That's why history is your friend. It allows me to bring some of these back and approach this a little bit more carefully than we did before. Um, so I'm going to just go from here to here. I don't want to remove these glasses. Just to, trying to do this relatively quickly. I sort of removed most of these wrinkles. Now I've said I wanted to blend those two together. Yes. Um, when you did this, the side right there by the, by the glasses, mm -hmm. wouldn't you sample from that side? More you could, a, a yeah, that would color. probably be better. Let me do that again. Good point. Let me go back. Um, try to find one that has similar texture. So if I take from here, the only problem is I don't have much of an area to work from. I can click here, and if I just click and I don't move the mouse, I don't drag it, notice the texture is the same now. See how it's grabbing the texture from here, where you can see more of the, they aren't wrinkles, it's more of the texture of the skin here, it's not as smooth. So instead of clicking and dragging, I'm just clicking so that that sample spot stays the same, the same place. No, close enough for right now. You get the basic idea. Um, if you're doing it for, you know, for serious, for real, you are going to want to sample, as you suggested, more carefully. And you do typically take the samples near where the, the part is being retouched, because generally speaking, color and or texture will be closest to those. But now what I can do is I can take this layer and I can adjust the opacity. And notice that I can start to blend and bring part of the underlying image back. So I can leave it 50, 60 percent. Notice how it still brings a little bit of the crease back, but not a lot. Really good. So the healing tool, very, very powerful and very effective for retouching of all. Um, we have another tool that's very similar, and it does it a little bit differently than the healing tool, and it's found underneath. It's the patch tool. So let's, they've added some graffiti and some bullet holes to this mountain, or this cliff, and the goal is to remove them. So what I can do is I can take and I can click and drag around this because this is the area that I want to fix. And now I move on top of it and I click and drag and try to find a similar texture and release. And I can hide the selection by hitting Command H and voila, it disappears pretty nicely. Command A, command H hides the selection, but you have to remember to hit Command D to deselect when you're done. So we're going to do the same with some of the, the rest of these. Uh, and they actually have you bring some of it back a little bit in the, in the exercise, but I'm focusing more on removing at the moment. So if I want to remove these little bullet holes, I'll put them on drag around. 
that the two-step process, you have that area selected, and maybe I want this texture here, and the command H, and hide it, and boom, it's gone. That's pretty nice. So that's pretty much what we're going to do here. Um, we can use the, the history, um, what they have us do, if I go back over here, is if I use in here the eraser, if I use the, um, I want to use the history, hold on here. History brush. There we go. Um, not the art history brush, but the history brush. And what that does is it will allow you to erase back to the whatever the last version you say. Does that make sense? Um, so if I keep the opacity 100%, watch what happens when I erase here. Notice how it brings them back. If I change the opacity, maybe to 20% and the flow, reduce it to maybe 30%, 25%. And now when I click on here, when I drag, where are the holes? They gradually come back. Just there we go. See how they come back, merge, emerge just a little bit. So it's not boom. It comes back. You bring it back in a subtle way. So you can control that. It doesn't have to be erase everything and leave it alone. So I'm leaving little dimples here. Can you do that? Can you use that also on the on the band-aid? The history, yeah. The history, the history brush tool can be used for anything. It's pretty nifty. Um, so if you feel you've made a mistake or you want to make the change more subtle. You can do that. You can totally erase, and then you can come back with a history erase tool. And what it does is it brings some of what you have saved, returning it back so that you get a blend between the two. Or in some cases, if you decided you made a mistake and you want it all to come back, that can be doable too. So we'll go ahead and we'll get rid of the rest of these. And that's pretty much it for this part of the assignment. Pretty straightforward. Um, but it works very nicely. Really nice. What is the flow for? Is it like the, uh, well, think of it like a. Um, have you ever used a, um, an airbrush? Sprayed with an aerosol can? It's, with an aerosol can, when you press on the button, it's all or nothing. It's very hard to control the air, the amount of air that comes out. In an airbrush, you can control if you press a little bit. A little bit of air comes out, and you get a, a slow stream of pigment that comes out. And the harder you press, the more pigment comes out and a bigger flow. So if you want to just have your paint come out or your image come out all at once in a big gush, have the flow turn away up. If you want to bring it back in smaller steps, then turn it back, and it comes back in a slower stream. And the same with the opacity, if you want it to come back 100% so that it's all there at once, or you want to bring it back in slow you know, steps. We've got a few more over here. And then pretty much it. I think they have a spring some of these back over there. But that's okay. Um, I mean, boom, there you have it. They're all removed. Very nice. So you've cleaned up your photo. You can remove wrinkles, you can fix textures and blemishes. <clears throat> and we have even yet another way of doing things, which is this is probably one of the oldest. Um, here is the finished version. And they've already added some type on a separate layer. We can turn that off. But what they've done is that they've created an image that looks like it was torn. The, tor the corner is torn. And oh, my image is ruined. How do I return it? How do I bring it back? It's also a beautiful photograph, but you'll notice that we see the sprinkler heads here. And I don't want to see them. I mean, I like having the sprinklers if you own this home, because then you don't have to handle water. But for 
aesthetics, visually, that looks kind of grungy. It doesn't help. It's a distraction. So instead, what we're going to use now is the common stamp tool. And that's this one. It looks like a rubber stamp. Um, we can control the size of the brush. I don't remember what size they tell us to use in here. I'm going to use um, maybe 19. Could use a little bit larger brush. Um, that's a good size. 27, 28 pixels. And to get the brush size, I right click on it. And that will bring out that sub menu. If you don't do that, oops. what um, you'll need to do is you select brushes up here, and that does appear. You have a bunch of brushes that you have, and there are even more available to you. But these are basic round brushes, hard edge, soft edge, um, brushes that look like natural media, charcoal, whatever. Um, you can have brushes and shapes, the sweet star, things like that. Question? Question? Yeah. Do you know any extra sites where you could download um, more stamps? Or oh. brushes? Um, <laughs> there are lots of them available. If I were to open up, you'll see how many there are. If we come over here, um, where is the our brushes? We have brushes here. Here we go. So these are the default brushes. It's basically what we see here. If you click here, you'll notice down here we have assorted brushes, or basic brushes, calligraphic brushes, drop shadow brushes, and on and on and on and on and on. And what we can do is you can either replace those or you can add to it. So what if I want to select some wet media brushes? If I'm painting in Photoshop and I want to create something that looks like a watercolor, select this and say that I want to append my existing brushes, not replace, but append. And now I have more when I come down here. You'll notice I have all these additional brushes that have been added. You can always come back to and select your basic brushes and select OK and that will replace them. Here's all my basic brushes. So we'll come back and let's go back and try again and try some that's where we're questions. And just append and I'll get some more. You'd be amazed at how many of them. Um, you can also create your own custom brushes, which I'm not sure they have exercises for anymore. Um, but if you remind me when I'm done with this or on another day, I can show you how to make your own custom brush. So, how this tool works is what it does based on the size and shape of your brush, it takes a sample of the image and it allows you to paint with it. So, what I want to do is I want to repair this corner and I want to align because um, you know, they are very careful about the images that they select for different parts, you know, different things that they choose. I want to make sure that the color and the texture are consistent as I paint down. So what I'm going to do is make sure that when I select the clone stamp tool, that I select a line, which it is, and I'm going to try to align right over here, like about so. I'm going to hold down the option key and click and what that does is it takes a sample from that spot. Now I can move over here and I can begin to paint. And notice where the crosshairs are. As I move down, it's taking a sample. And notice it doesn't quite match, does it? It's not that good. I probably, when I'm done, want to undo and come back and do it again. I can see a little change here. So let's undo that. And as long as you do that in one fell swoop, you're in good shape. So maybe I should get closer to it and take the sample and then click. And now it will probably look closer. 
because I'm grabbing that. Got to be careful. Let's go back up. We'll take another sample from right here. And now I can, and be careful so I don't overlap. And now the color and the texture are looking closer. There's still a little bit of a difference, but you get the basic. And you can come back and you can fiddle with it all you like. And what it's doing is it's painting and taking that texture sample and replacing the whole. And it looks pretty easy. It could probably be better. The same is true for these areas. You're going to zoom in and find, probably take a look, a smaller area or a smaller brush. So let's, instead of 28, I'll switch it back to a nice hard brush here. I guess you could use a soft brush. Um, I'm not being small. Maybe. 16 pixels, okay. And I want to click from right here. Option, click, and then move over and just click. Not even drag. And if you're careful, you can massage this a little bit and get it so that it fits. You make some nice changes. You won't be able to do it. Similar to the other area over here. Take a sample close to it and click. Before you know it, you can't tell where that was. So that's the clone stamp tool. Ta da! Only took a half an hour with that. The exercise is done. Very powerful tools, though. Very, very nice. You want me to go on to the next exercise? Or do you want time to work on this and then we come back to the other? Because maybe we can move ahead a little bit quicker than what I have planned. Next. Look. Next. Next. Next one? Okay. Because this is pretty easy to use. Um, the next one isn't quite so easy. So rather than try to follow along and watch so I can get the rest of this in my video, and um, I'll do it again next Wednesday if necessary. So let me go to some time open. from my CD, lessons, uh, lesson four, start and end. Okay. used to have something that looked like Mr. Potato Head. Um, they intentionally, in this exercise, want us to not use layers. Even though a better way to approach this would be to use layers, but instead what we're doing in here is that we're using a number of different selection tools. The other day when we isolated the coin, we just used the circular or elliptical selection tool. And now we're going to use a variety of them in order to grab different elements in here. And I'm probably not going to do this in the same order as the book, um, but you'll get the basic idea. And I hope that I use all of the tools that they've selected. Um, anyway, when you do it, you'll get the idea. And I'll also explain some other, some other things on the fly. So um, let me zoom out of this one a little bit since I need to know where I want to place these. And I'll set it to the side. And I want to zoom in on this one so I can get a better look at it. Command plus. We get a nice view of this. Now, one of the things you have to realize on a particular layer, especially as a background layer, is that when you use a selection tool, in this case, if I select, use the rectangle tool, and I select the little cutting board, and I decide that I want to move the cutting board. <clears throat> Notice that when I move the cursor on top of that, the marching ants, 
that I see a little black arrow with the scissors. That means as soon as I click and I drag, I'm going to cut that image. And what it does is it cuts it to the background. Notice what I've done here. I swapped and I made my black my background color here. Even though you don't see it, um, you will in a moment. Well, as soon as I click and I drag and I move, Notice what it does, is it, it's as if I had a black piece of paper underneath, and I cut that shape out and I wrenched it from its background. So when you're working on a single layer, that's what you're doing, and at the moment, this image is floating. If I deselect, and I try to move it now, all I do is it won't allow me to do it because it's the background layer and it's wrenched. If it was even the top layer, this doesn't move anymore. It's actually fixed to the bottom. And so I have this gaping black hole, and notice I've also covered up part of my other images. Not good. So let's undo. And since I can't undo, let's bring up my history. Where's history, history, history? Window, history. History's been somewhere here. Let's go back. Move, move, go back, or even to my open file. So that's the tricky part in here. Be careful when you move things. But as soon as you deselect on a layer, it's fixed. It's a part of that. It's like it's glued to that. As soon as you try to reselect and move it again, it's going to wrench it from its background. That's why in the next exercise, when you use layers, you'll probably want to isolate those elements on different layers so that you can move them wherever you like and it will not be a problem. You won't have to worry about it cutting from the background. That's, this is kind of the old way before layers came out a long, long time ago in version 3. When I started using um, Photoshop version 1 or 2, something like that, um, it was a pain. You really had to think carefully about what you were doing. Um, because once it was flattened or you deselected the marching ants, it was permanent. You couldn't go back and change it. It was really a mess. Lots of different ways to select them. Let's just start and kind of go around the horn here and um, pick. Um, and let's start to see. Let's start with the head of lettuce for cabbage or whatever this is. Um, it would be hard to trace around this, wouldn't it? There's a number of tools we could use. I could use the lasso tool and I could draw around it. Um, actually, one of the best tools right now would be the quick selection tool. I could click and drag it here. And notice how it does a really nice job. You're going to probably want to use this tool a lot. This is new to CS3, wasn't available in CS2, and it really does a beautiful job. This is just not doable before. Some people think, well, maybe let's use the magic wand tool. Well, the magic wand is pretty cool for certain things, but if I click in here, notice that based on the default 32 pixel color sample, it only selects a part of it. I hold down the shift key, and it selects more. Before you know it, I've got a mouse. Well, because I have a white background, there is, in fact, another way to select this. I can start by selecting the whole entire area. And because I have a white background, another way of doing this would be now to select the magic wand tool. But instead of selecting the, the lettuce, I'm going to select the background. To remove the background from this selection, because right now this entire rectangular area is selected, if I hold down the option to Alt key, this allows me to remove parts of the selection. So you can always make a selection and you can add and subtract from it. By using the magic wand tool, because it will only select the white area, and selecting the option key, I will be deleting the white area from this. So now what I do is by holding down the option key and I click on it, voila, now I have before this quick selection tool, this is the way you would have to do this. Now it looks really nifty. Now I can come over here to the move tool and I can, I'm going to go back to foreground, the background is white, and when I move it, you will never know the difference because the white matches the white. I think a better way to work though is I like to keep my originals intact, intact. And they do have you do this in, exercise, in this exercise, but I'm going to have you do it from the very start. Because what if you need to use those images again? 
or you want to make a duplicate of them or something else, like we did, like we're going to do with a little circular thing here, a little label. If you hold down the Option key, notice how the icon changes. After we select the Move tool, notice how you get a double arrow, a black and white. As soon as I click and I drag, what it does is it makes a copy of it. Now I move it into place, and as long as I see the marching ants, it's a floating image. So I want to try to get this as best I can located about where it's supposed to be. Like about so. And as soon as I deselect, it's fixed. Now I can always use history undo to go back. But if I decide later on and think, you know, I'm smart, I can't use that selection of these before, but if I use the quick selection tool and I select all of this, and I come back to my move tool and I move it, look what I've done. It now looks like a cookie cutter. See how it cuts it away? So when you are on the same layer and you're moving, you're combining elements, you do need to be careful. So that's why this exercise is useful, but it's almost an anachronism because what you're going to do in most cases is separate elements on each layer. But it is a good exercise in teaching you how to, to work with different selection tools and when some selection tools work better than others to, to isolate images. So I'm happy with the placement. I'm done. Um, let's come back here. What else do I have to select? Let's select um, more around. Let's select the bell pepper and put that in. Um, notice in the bell pepper, if I select, if I zoom in here, if I try to use the magic wand tool and I try to select the background, not a very good job, does it? Is it not too good? So that doesn't work. I could use the lasso tool and I can draw around this. That's kind of hard to do. Um, we will do that for another one. Unfortunately, the quick selection tool probably works the best. <laughs> hold down the shift key and select and hold down the option key and re remove. And before you know it, you know, you've got it selected pretty nicely. Nice. So the, the quick selection tool ultimately probably will be your best friend. But for right now, under the uh, lasso tool, we're going to use the magnetic lasso tool, which is a little different. And what I like to do is I don't like seeing the icons of the tools. I find them a distraction. In this case, I prefer to see the crosshairs. So by hitting the tab key, I can toggle on and off what tool I see. I can also make that change permanent in preferences or change it as often as I want. I'm going to zoom in so I can see this a little bit more clearly. And it doesn't matter really where I start, but I'm going to click. And you'll notice as I move, it, it starts to actually, based on color sampling, it automatically, even though I'm not real accurate, it's based on that little circle of influence there. And every time I move just a short distance, I am clicking the mouse to add little anchor points. But it actually finds the edge of the bell pepper pretty well. They can differentiate, mostly based on color sampling, as far as I know. It could be value as well. And I'm trying to be pretty accurate here. So I'm probably moving shorter distances than I probably really need to and uh, periodically click to grab samples. But it automatically just it follows it pretty nicely. This is the quick selection? No, this is the um, magnetic lasso tool. Just another tool for selecting. There's so many ways of selecting. And to do what pretty much what we're doing here, to isolate images. And when I come all the way back around, and you can either go clockwise or counterclockwise, if you can see carefully, notice that the icon changes and there's a little circle in the lower right hand corner. Because <coughs> as soon as I click, I get the marching ants. I've gone all the way around. 
I've ended up where I started. Now I can zoom back out. And I can, I can once again pull down the option key. Oops. Oh, the remove tool. I can use the option key. key. And I can make a copy of it and move it in place. Before you select. Let's move it up a little bit. Now what they have done with these two, and it's not fair, is they're adding um, drop shadows to these to kind of soften the edge a little bit. And I'll show you with the next one what happens if you're not careful when making your selection. Select. And let's now select the olives. It's an ellipse, so what do you think you might use? The ellipse tool. It's a good tool. But actually, you probably use try the smart selection and you get a pretty good. But it's pretty grainy. It's not too good. But it's pretty decent. A lot quicker than it. Doing what we're going to do next. But still, you never know. Smart selection doesn't move, move, work in every instance. So now I'll select um, the ellipse tool. In this one, the way I'm doing this is a little difficult. But again, it's like patting your head and rubbing your stomach at the same time. By default, when you select the ellipse tool, to make an ellipse or a circle, you click and you drag. But notice it doesn't match underline. It's hard because I'm working diagonally. So I'm going to release and deselect and start over again. But this time, I want to make, make the ellipse from the center outward. It might be a little bit easier if I find the approximate center of my selection expand it outward and then I'll show you another button to hit to be able to move that selection on the fly to find unit. So by holding down the, the alt key or option key, what I can do is now it makes a selection from the center, not diagonally. And actually, you know what, I got pretty darn close, not quite, but pretty darn good, but not quite. And I'm going to goof this on purpose. By holding down the space bar and not releasing the mouse, I can move this. And we get it really close. And I'm going to get it right on the line. That looks pretty good, doesn't it? I'm going to re release the mouse. And it looks really good, but watch what happens when I move it. So let's zoom out. It's not good at all. Be quick with this. Hold down, go ahead and switch to the move tool for hit V. Hold down the option key and move it over. And now I want to see what my selection looks like before I deselect it. So I'm going to hide the marching nails. And when I look here carefully, I see a white fringe gone. So if you select just so much as one pixel outside of that, it's going to bring that fringe over. So there's a couple of ways to work. Since I made a copy of this, I can delete this, and I can go back. So I'll start my selection process over here. The ellipse tool, zoom in, work from the center, pull down the option key, click and drag. What I want to do, in this particular instance, is center this as best I can. And I want my selection to be probably one pixel inside my selection here. So that it's just inside the selection. Zoom in. 
you don't see any fringe, do you? Much better. So when you do mix selections, you're going to have to be very careful that sometimes it's better to, rather than to go right on the edge, to go inside that one pixel. There is another way to do this, that when you have a selection, you can have it grow, or you can modify it, and you can expand or contract the selection. And you can expand or contract it by as, what, as little as one pixel. And that will be helpful. So if you are right on the line, and you don't want to make the selection again, you'll just say contract, and have it contract in one pixel increments, and before you know it, you'll have a really good selection. So you take that fringe away. So what else do we have? That's another tool. Let's do the carrot next, I think. Um, we're around the horn. Carrot, I guess, is the next one we're going to move, and we're going to use um, the, the lasso tool. And that's probably my least favorite. Um, and this, with the new tools that are available now, this really just doesn't work. It's a very crude tool, but they're not going to get rid of it anytime soon. But what you do is, because it works like a freehand tool, you have to give yourself enough space over here with your mouse. And you carefully draw around it. And if you slip like that, it can be disastrous. But, you know, not impossible. It's really hard for me to use this tool. It's like drawing with a bar of soap in the mouse. It just doesn't work. And it's a very crude selection. And I just don't, I'm not forget it. It's too old. I'm going to cheat. We're going to use this quick selection tool. And hold down the shift key to add. And this looks pretty good. Not quite perfect. Pretty good. See how I added too much? So this is a perfect tool. It's close, but we can add and subtract from here. So let's zoom in a little bit more, and let's see this a little bit more clearly. See how some of this is still a part of this? Now maybe it would be a good time to use this tool. But by holding down the shift key, it will allow me to add to the selection by holding down the option key and using one of the other selection tools that allow me to remove from the selection. So I want to remove this from the selection. So I'm going to use the, the lasso tool, hold down the option key, and I'm going to start out here and click and drag across here. Close it up to see how I've removed it. Hold down the shift key, and I'm going to click in here, and I'm going to add a little bit. I go all the way around, notice how it added to that selection. Close but no cigar. I'm going to refine the edge. And this is new to CS3. What I can do in here, it shows me what this edge is going to look like. Um, shift is to remove. Shift is to add to the selection. Option to all is to remove from the selection. But now what I can do, now that I have this close, this is OK. I might want to refine this. But notice that I can expand the selection. I can contract the selection. I can smooth the selection a little bit. And whatever looks right. And you can also have these different options to see exactly what the mask looks like, see what it looks like on a white background, on a black background, with ruby lift, with the normal lift. You can compute and tweak it. White background looks good. So there's lots of tools that we'll be using later on in here that allow you to refine the selection very quickly. And they do a very, very nice job. So I'll click OK here. This still needs a bit of work. This looks kind of grimy. But you can keep zooming way in. And if I want, I can, you know, for, for certain projects, you are going to really take your time 
and I want to remove from this selection right here, uh, right here, that little part. And I'm going to add to this selection here. So I click here, so I get a little bit more of the edge. Maybe refine this a little bit. I can bring part of the carrot in here. So I'll add to the selection here. Just going to drag. Whoops. I don't know why that happened. Let's hold down the shift key. I'm going to add this. Better. You know, once again, what I can do is to go ahead and select the move. Hold down the option key to make a copy of it. But if you notice the final piece, we want this at an angle, don't we? So what I can do before I release it is I can transform it. I can resize it. I can rotate it. I can do a variety of things to it. Um, the best way is to remember the key command, command T for transform. And I get this little box. And now notice when the cursor is outside it, that allows me to click and rotate. I can rotate the carrot. I can move it in place. And before you know it, you've got it. Your carrot isolated in a pretty different shape. And when you're done, either double click or hit the return key. And you need to be careful again because we're on this layer that I, I cannot move it when I'm done. I have to use my history panel. So anything that I do after that, like the um, tough shape. Space bar to move it in place. Release the space bar and then make it contract just a little bit. Get it to fit just inside the edge. And release. 
And now I'm going to make a copy of it. I'm going to zoom out. So, you everybody follow what I did with that? I held down the option key so that I was able to make the selection from the center outward. To constrain the proportions to make sure it was a perfect circle, I also held down the shift key. That will lock it in. The shift key in most programs will lock proportions that will constrain them. So if you're making a shape from scratch, it will be a perfect square or a perfect circle or whatever. Also, when you're moving objects, if you want to move it perfectly horizontal or vertically or a 45 degree angle, you're holding on the shift key, that will work good. And then to move the selection before it's been fixed, if you hold down the space bar, then and you continue to click and drag with the mouse, it will move that selection. Then you release the space bar, it fixes it. Don't release the mouse, but release the space bar, and when you have it in place, you release the mouse and then you have your selection as a set. Now I can go ahead and I'm going to select, I'm going to move this, make a copy of it, move it in place, like so, and I'm going to hit Command I for invert, and it converts it to green. Why they have you do that, I don't know. There are other ways of doing this. Command I inverts. What it does is it takes whatever colors you have, and it, it takes the opposite color in the color board. So it's the complementary color to that. Now what it's asking us to do is to make copies of each of these two times on the fly, and that's what I've been doing all along, and then resize them and make a copy again. Once I make a copy of this and resize it, this is fixed. So by holding down the option and or command key and move it, this other one is fixed now. I hit command T, transform, hold down the shift key, and move to constrain. I can move it a little bit like so. Hit return key to fix that. And then when I hit option command again, make a copy again. Notice that all of these now, these previous two ones are fixed. Now I hit command T, transform again, hold down the shift key and drag to enlarge. And I would not do that too much. Because if I do it too much, watch what happens. Actually, it looks pretty good. It's a little blurry, but it looks pretty good. In most cases, though, you will get blurriness, graininess. It's not something you want to do. So I would enlarge, I would be careful in enlarge things just ever so slight. Hit return to fix it or double click inside it. When I'm done, deselect. One final step. We want to get rid of all this extra stuff that we have here. And that, to do that, we use the crop tool. And we click and we drag, and the areas that are grayed out are the areas that will be eliminated from our image. And what you need to realize with bitmap or raster programs, which this is one, that every extra pixel adds dramatically to your file size. Even though it might be a white background, it doesn't matter. Pixels count. So let's look here. Notice that this is 19 megabytes over 16 megabytes. And as soon as I hit the return key or double click in here, and I crop all that extra stuff out of there, watch how dramatically, how dramatically smaller the file size will be. Nine. Nineteen nine. All that extra area was ten megabytes. Okay. Yes. Going back to the magnet, uh, magnet tool. Mm -hmm. Say that I know in CS2 I always have a hard time. Say that you start, you know, selecting your side, but then from your last point to your current one, you kind of mess up. Is there a way you can go back to that last point? Or do you have to start all over? Um, you should be able to, but you're right, it is tricky. Let me try with 
one of these again. And uh, let's do that real quick. Where is that thing? We'll put it. My data class are cool. It's in there. And let's start. I'm going to go around quickly. You notice I'm already goofing up a little bit. It's actually doing a pretty good job. do is I could remove from this selection and I could use the same tool. So whatever I'm going to take the option key, hold it down, and click here and drag across. I'm going to go around like so. And that remove it. So that's another way to do it. You can always add or subtract from the selection. But that does ring a bell. There's a key that you hit. It's so rare that I use the tool that allows you to slide it back. And I can't remember. I'm going to have to look that one up. Yeah, that's the only thing I would have. Okay. Who's the option key? Is that the option? Is that what it is? No, right click, 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 click. No, these options. That allows, that doesn't allow me to go back. Shit. No. I'm going to just make that big mouse. Maybe because of women. I had the um, caps lock turned on. Let's go to um, Photoshop preferences. Um, cursors. I would always like precise for these cursors and normal brush tip for this one. Let's try one more time. I'm running out of paper. And I don't have cap locks turned on. I hit option. No, that's not. Command. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's best to turn it off and go back and look and see. So those are two exercises in one day.